scientist whose name was Van Helmont. Mm -hmm. And here is the experiment that he did. So before we get to this, for a long time people have wondered, okay, where do living things come from? And where um, do, and they witness certain things that caused them to think in a certain way that we later found out was incorrect. So here's what Van Helmont said in his research. If you press a piece of underwear soiled with sweat together with some wheat in an open mouth jar, after about 21 days, the odor changes and the ferment coming out of the underwear and penetrating through the husks of wheat turns into mice. But what's more remarkable is that the mice, that mice of both sexes emerge. And these mice successfully reproduce with mice born naturally from parents. What is even more remarkable is that the mice which come out of the wheat were not small mice, not even miniature adults or aborted mice, but adult mice emerge. So that's what Van Helmet said. He took some sweaty underwear, put it in an open jar, mixed it with some wheat. Can I try that when I get home? Sure. Well, I'm doing that. Found out after about three weeks that mice came out of this jar. And so he, came, he had the idea that if you mix sweaty underwear in wheat, it turns into mice. I'm not sure why I want to agree. So, let me just ask this yes or no question. Do you agree with his conclusion? Yes. Okay. All right, so if you said no, right now answer these two questions. So if you think no, that this experiment does not show that sweaty underwear and wheat turns into mice, what was probably actually happening, and what was wrong with the way he actually set up his original experiment? So take a minute. Answer those two questions. Yeah, one and two. question? All right, so let's, let's talk about this. So I know most of you don't agree with Van Helmont's conclusion that sweaty underwear and wheat turns into mice. What was really, what do you think was really happening in this experiment then? Tommy? Since the jar was open, how did mice climb into it and Okay. And then Okay. Haley, what were we going to say? Oh, it's the same thing. Same exact thing? Well, Mike probably went into the jar because they were going to have to smell. Okay. CJ? I said that same thing as that, but the only thing that was really good was just that smell and it was just a little bit Okay. Bara?
Okay, and that's what he saw? All right, Israel? Maybe the mice had had a home or something, and the dry was just an express thing for them. Okay. And they were in there for like 21 days. Okay, all right. Good ideas. So what was wrong in the way that he set up this experiment? There was just one problem, Tanya. The underwear? Well, what a, not so much the underwear, but why these things you, you guys told me that you don't think it's true. Alex? Since the jar is open. Yeah, that the jar was open. And having that jar open means, like you guys said, what, Olivia? The smells could come out. The smells could come out. What about the mice, Haley? Oh, I had a different. What were you gonna say? I said it was probably it was like like he didn't do enough experiments in different places. Okay. And so he, he jumped to a conclusion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. He jumped to the conclusion. He should have tested it um, more. And was he making this experiment for the mice, or was he just? Yeah. Yes, he was doing it to see, because people had observed this before. So like you said, the jar was open. He also didn't keep a constant watch on it for 21 days, because if he did, he probably would have said, like you guys just mentioned, that mice were attracted to the smell and to the food source, the wheat. And so he probably crawled in there, maybe made a, a nest there, eventually um, gave birth to baby mice, which is what he actually saw coming out. But was it that the wheat and underwear turned into mice? No. Oh. No, that may sound silly to us, but that was actually a commonly held belief um, hundreds of years ago. Olivia? Oh, I said that even if it did work, it would probably be like living things. Like if it was a mice and a bird, it would be like, it's like they probably make like, 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 they make like a bird slash mice kind of. That doesn't happen. But it's just like, but so you're saying there had to be something living in there to begin with? Yeah. All right. So this idea is called spontaneous generation. Bless you. It was the idea that people had for a long, long time that living things, living organisms, could come from non-living things. That's what people thought. That living things can come from non-living things. But why wheat and sweaty underwear? Just that's what. Just one example. So why do you think people thought this? Because they use. Olivia. Uh, the scientists were like jumping to the conclusion, and people were kind of thinking about other people, like they're probably thinking what most people thought, so then they didn't look weird. Okay. Yeah, and they saw certain things that if you don't know um, where science was not as advanced, and so they saw certain things that seemed to make sense of that. Let me just give you some examples. People saw that if you took a piece of meat, they just left it out, after just a couple days, maggots would appear on it, tiny little white worm-like creatures. Now, they just would sort of appear there. They didn't seem to come from anywhere. So what people thought was that rotting meat turned into this, these maggots, these little worms. They thought it actually, the rotting meat turned into them. Right? Wait, I still think that. That's people that saw that in the springtime, where once um, the snow thawed, that frogs would just emerge from the mud where there hadn't been any frogs there all throughout the winter. All of a sudden, there's frogs coming out of the mud, and they thought that the mud turned into frogs in the springtime. Okay? They saw that if you put a piece of bread, after a little while, it starts to turn into this moldy living organism, even though they didn't see any mold there before. So they thought that the bread actually turned into the mold. So if you don't know a lot about science, some of these things may seem to make sense. That, okay, yeah, if I leave this piece of meat out, there were no maggots before, and now all of a sudden there are these worms crawling all over it, the meat must have turned into those maggots. Oh, shit. Okay. 
So, those are magnets. Um, you know, sometimes um, this happens last year and it happened again this year, is that my wife was making something, I think chicken or something. She threw the chicken in our outside, our garbage can that we put out at the road is outside of our house. But the bag wasn't sealed or something, and so one day I went and I opened up the garbage, there's all these maggots crawling all over the inside of the garbage. Pretty gross. Um, what did you do? Nothing. Just put it out. Eventually they took the garbage away, they had no more food, they eventually died. Um, we could rinse them out. Um, again, bread and mold. The bread seems to just turn into the mold. Okay? Frogs emerging from the mud in the spring. These are things that people might think, well, these living things are coming from these non-living materials. What do what does mold come from? We're gonna talk mold will mold comes from other mold. And mold reproduces by something called spores. So floating through the air are tiny little microscopic mold oh. spores. And so if they land on a piece of bread, for example, after a couple of days, they can start to grow into the mold. But they didn't come from the bread turning into mold. They came from one of these reproductive cells that landed on the bread and started growing. I mean, I didn't think bread was like made of mold, but I yeah. like, didn't know where it yeah, comes from. Yeah, sort of floating through the air. Suddenly it just appears. Right, and it happens to land on it. It's a good environment for the mold to start growing and it starts to grow there. Olivia? Well, this one bread company, a bagel company, um, we got two packages of bagels. And so I got a bagel and I opened it up and it was all moldy. And then from a different package, same company, there was only one in each pack. I got the moldy one too. Oh, really? Yeah, and it could, and in those mold spores, once the mold is growing on the bread, it will release spores and they can land on other pieces of bread. All right, so now what I want to do is just let's talk about some of the scientists that helped us understand that these things are not true, that living things do not come from non living things. One of the first scientists was a guy named Francesco Reddy. He was an Italian scientist. He was doing his work in 1686, or 1668. And he did some experiments with maggots, with rotting meat. Okay? What he did, the problem, again, if we go back to the scientific method, the problem he was studying, the question he was asking is, where do these maggots actually come from? That was his problem. And he had a hypothesis. Okay? Many people believe the meat turned into the maggots, but he thought something else. He thought that the maggots actually came from flies. Is that true? We'll talk about it in a second. So he set up a pretty simple experiment. <coughs> he took a couple jars, jar one and jar two. And inside of those jars, he just put some meat and let it just rot there. But on jar one, he left open. The top of the jar was open. In jar two, he covered it with like a cloth so that no flies could get in there. So pretty simple. If the rotting meat did turn into maggots, you would expect what? Where would you expect to find maggots after this experiment? On, the on, on both of them, if the meat turns into maggots. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when he did the experiment, what he found was that didn't happen. What he found is that in jar one, <coughs> he would see flies clustering around it. He'd see them landing on the meat, laying their eggs. In jar number two, we'd see the flies were still attracted to that smell of the rotting meat, but they couldn't get actually get to it to lay their eggs. They would land on the cloth and sort of walk around there. And what he noticed, on jar one, maggots appeared on the meat. In jar two, maggots appeared on the screen. Israel? The, they didn't, they weren't more, the flies weren't going into flies. 
the maggots weren't turning in the or flies weren't turning in the maggots. When the flies lay the eggs, that's they're like little baby maggots. You're exactly right. And then when the baby maggots grow older and stuff, they turn into flies. Yep, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's what he know. He noticed that the maggots formed on the chunks of meat in jar one, but on jar two they formed on the screen. Okay? And so his conclusion was that maggot meat doesn't turn into maggots. Maggots do come from flies. And that's true. What Israel just said is a hundred percent correct. Maggots are actually what we call fly larva. Just like what's a butterfly larva? Caterpillar. Caterpillar. Well, a fly larva is a maggot. Ma when flies lay eggs, they hatch into maggots, which eat a lot. Eventually, they turn into flies. Okay? So it wasn't that the meat was turning into the flies. It was that flies lay eggs on rotting meat, which then hatch into maggots, which eventually turn into flies. So he showed that this idea that the meat turns into maggots was incorrect. That the maggots actually were coming from flies. Anna? Oh, is this guy French? He was Italian. No, that was that's Charles Darwin. All right, uh, Ava. Does that mean when flies <coughs> land on you, they lay their eggs? They they may, but they generally maggots eat rotting flesh. You know, sometimes if there's an animal with a really bad wound that was infected, it could eat, it could get infected with maggots. When I had a really big cut on my leg, flies landed on me. Oh yeah. Yeah, and when we talk about inverts, we'll talk more about maggots, and sometimes maggots are used to actually help people heal. Um, but yeah, maggots, um, flies do lay their eggs on rotting material, and then it, but they won't eat healthy tissue. So if a fly lands on you and lays an egg, it's not going to hatch into a maggot on your skin. Um, I was watching a couple of stories in the ER, and some lady um, supposedly got bit by something and then she like had this weird feeling in her neck like coming back from her honeymoon and they like found like cut open her neck and found out that she had like a ton of baby maggots in her. Yeah, I mean it can happen occasionally in a wound like that. Alright, and quick question and we're gonna move on. Um spiders my mom had a patient once and they had she got a spider bite in her bones. And they opened it up and there were a bunch of things. Yeah, I've heard some stories like that too. All right, so Francesco already helped people start to think that, okay, maybe spontaneous generation is incorrect, that living things can't come from non living things. Talk about a couple more experiments. Next guy, also Italian, Lazzaro Spallanzani. He did his research in 1787. Now, what he was working on, he noticed that broth, like in soup, if it were left out, eventually it, stuck, it turned and started to smell bad, it would make people sick, it would spoil. And it would spoil because there's living things living in that broth. And so what people thought was that the broth just turned into these microbes, these tiny little organisms. And so he was doing a research where uh, he wanted to know what caused these little microbes, these little organisms to form in the broth. Was it the broth turning into them, or was there more going on? Mm -hmm. okay. So his hypothesis was that it's not that the broth is turning into these microbes. That's not what's going on. But actually, these microbes are floating around in the air. They happen to land in the broth and start to grow there. So he did an experiment where he took some broth, chicken broth or something. First step is he heated it up in a flask, a container. And then he had two of these flasks. One of them he let cool and left open at the top and waited. The other one, he heated the broth, but then he sealed the flask, covered it, and let it wait. What he found is that the, the flask that was open spoiled. Microbes started to grow inside of it. But in the flask that he heated up and then covered, 
no microbes formed in there until he opened it up and then let it sit a little longer and then they started to form. So what do you think his conclusion was? Okay, did the microbes come from the air or was it the broth turning into them? Holly? Yeah, that he was correct. The microbes came from the air because as long as he didn't leave that air in there, the broth didn't spoil. There were no microbes. So again, it wasn't broth turning into these things. They were floating in the air. So when he did this experiment, what need of life was he removing? We just talked about the needs of life. Why didn't the microbes grow in here? What was he taking away? Hey? Yeah, the air. He also took away the proper temperature when he heated it up very high. Okay, one more scientist to talk about. The next one is called Louis Pasteur. He was French. Louis Pasteur was French. He was doing his research in 1859. And Louis Pasteur said, okay, I'm going to take it a step farther. Not only do I think the microbes are in the air, but they're actually not in the air itself. They're actually attached to little dust particles in the air. That's where these microbes are. They're on the dust, not just on their own. So he did it. So he thought the microbes are carried by dust, not the air itself. And so he did an experiment. In his experiment, he had a special type of flask that had this long tube attached to the end. It's curved in this way. And so he boiled some broth in these flasks. Now, because of the shape of this tube, air could get in one end and get to the broth, but dust could not. It got stuck in the curb of the flask. So air could get in, broth, um, air could get in, dust could not. So when he boiled this flask and he left it here, air is getting in, but not dust, and no microbes grew. In the other one, he boiled it, left the stem on for a while, no microbes grew, but then once he broke it off, then they did start growing. So what do you think his conclusion was in this experiment? Anna? Um, that, uh, our dust. Yeah, that they are on the dust. Because the only time it got infected is when dust could get in there. So he said, okay, these microbes not only are the in there, they're actually on little particles of dust sort of hitching a ride. And that's why the broth was spoiling. Because these dust particles carried in. And tomorrow we'll learn a little bit more about Pasteur. We talk a little bit about why, hold on, don't put things way up, about why you may be familiar with his name. So by the end, what all of this should tell us is that is spontaneous generation true? No. Living things do not come from non-living things. All living organisms come from other living organisms. So dust can be living? Dust contains microbes on it that are living. Now, one last interesting fact. For centuries, people knew okay, that drinking beer was less likely to make people sick than drinking water from streams and rivers. In fact, um, they used to brew special types of beer that were low in alcohol to give to children, rather than drink water from natural sources. Okay? So the question is, what made people, why did water make people, but beer that was made with the same exact water did not? 
Why do you think that was true? Kristen? Because maybe like the water that they used to make up the beer was like clean. It was actually the same water. Oh, oh, okay. It was the same water. CJ? Throughout the process, they um, heat it up, and the water boils, and boil water, and it's water Good. Yeah, that's exactly right. Part of the process to make beer is to boil the water with the ingredients of the beer. And so what would happen is as they boil that water, what happens to those microbes? Um, well, it doesn't so much clean them, but it kills those microbes. They can't survive in those temperatures. So it kills those microbes so they're no longer living and they can no longer make people sick. What could they have done, they didn't make the connection right away, what could they have done rather than going through the whole process of making beer, what is in the other step they could have done or something a little simpler? Really? What could they have done rather than go through the whole process of making beer, what could they have done to improve? They could have just boiled water. In fact, today, like in your neighborhood, if a water main breaks and there could have been some bacteria introduced in your water, what do they tell everybody to do before drinking their water? Boil it. Okay? That's because it can kill any bacteria that would be in there and it's not going to make